Maybe we should like make his fingers splay a bit. I so do can... remember loving King Kong, the uh, original King Kong, and seeing the way the fur moves. It boils because you know when they're moving the puppets, the fur is is being moved each time, and the fur just kind of ripples along. And I always liked that. I decided that it would be nice to adapt Fantastic Mr. Fox. That was just naturally to me the way we ought to do it because I uh, because, just because I've always loved stop motion. People would do get carried away by the look of, and feel of this animation. We're so used to either drawn animation or computer generated animation that when you see animation like this, which is tangible, it's real light on real characters and a set, people respond to it differently. And I feel like the telling of this story in this medium will definitely transport people to a different place and a different time. I think it's perfect for someone like Wes who loves to direct every detail in his films from the costumes to the logos on the costumes to the set dressing to of course the acting, the dialogue. He usually writes his films and directs them and blocks out exactly where the camera's gonna go. The animation in some sense is like the natural extension of that kind of work because he really can plan almost every detail. The stop motion process, which is really exciting, is that you build a set, an animator will go into that stage and basically move the puppet one frame at a time and take a picture each time. When he comes out of that dark stage, you have a beautiful shot that you cut into your movie. It sounds like a crazy system, but except for that guy that has to go in the dark room and push the puppet one frame at a time, it's a pretty amazing art form. In the high speed thick of things in the stop motion animation, You've got an animator who is ultimately kind of like an actor and they're gonna do a gesture, just in a, it's gonna develop a certain way just because they're really in the moment and that's something that is a creative thing that the animator adds to the direction. I'm Mark Gustafson and I'm the animation director. I deal with all the animators on a day-to-day -day basis and try and help them understand what their shots are about and what's gonna happen in them and how they're going to execute the shots. Every puppet is different, and every animator is different, so you'll get some pretty amazing things out of these puppets in terms of expressions. You may not be able to do it exactly the way you think, so you, you have to use a different strategy. You have to communicate it through more body language. One of the difficulties we have is characters covered with fur and getting a performance to sort of come through the fur. If you imagine facial muscles, cheeks, and eyebrows and things. All of that stuff is under a layer of fur, so movement is sort of somewhat masked by that. So you just have to exaggerate things maybe a little bit more than you would otherwise. They're almost like little taxidermied animals with clothes on in a way, and uh, that presents a lot of challenges. When you look back at King Kong and sort of early stop frame movies where they've used real fur, you can see it moving under the light, sort of boiling is what we call it. That's the sort of uh, stuff, you know, you try to avoid. But Wes really wanted to see some of that, sort of hark back to a Starovich film where they use lots of real fur and textures and the costumes moved around a bit. It also predates video assist, so they couldn't see what they were doing until they developed the film the day after. So he wanted to have a little bit of that feel to it. So we've limited how much control we've given to the sort of puppets and the surfaces of everything. And that gives them their own style for this particular show. You can see that the costumes move a little bit. You can see that the fur moves a little bit. Some shots, just to keep it alive, the animators might just blow on the fur and it'll just gently ripple. And then as they're taking the frames, it'll just keep it alive. A hot set is a set that is in the process of being shot. That means there's an animator in there and he's animating. And if he doesn't finish that shot at the end of the day, or she doesn't finish that shot at the end of the day, uh, that set goes hot overnight, as we say, and that just means it's continuing to be shot, so no one goes on that set and touches anything. But everything has to be absolutely registered on a day-to-day -day basis, so all the lighting stands are glued to the floor and weighted. The sets are glued to the floor. The sets are made out of marine ply, so there's the minimum amount of change in them. But we do suffer a lot from temperature change, and we suffer a lot from ambient atmospheric moisture. It sounds a bit kind of geeky, but actually, if it's rained the night before, you'll come in the next day and guarantee that most of the sets will have shifted. And because that's mid-shot, that's the night before frame and the following morning frame, you will see an appreciable jump in the shot when it's played through. We try to alleviate that as much as possible. You know, we hang weights off the bottom of the sets, but sometimes we just have to let the sets settle back to a position over the course of three or four hours before they're ready to shoot on. One of the problems we have on this set, rather interestingly, is that the air gap at the top of the cider 
response to barometric pressure. So the level of the cider goes up and down. We thought at first it was evaporating, but the level comes back because the atmospheric pressure dictates the pressure of the air gap. So all the cider in the bottles jumps up and down through the shop. It's absolutely normal, to be honest, for animation. It's completely normal that this sort of thing happens. You can guarantee you will get a degree of set shift overnight. We're very used to just taking that on board. There's very little running around waving your hands in the air saying, what do we do about this? Because on some level we've seen it all before and we have to accommodate it. I think the biggest difference between live action and, and any animation is you get one take. You can't shoot your actors and then say, you know, can I have another one and change something slightly. You've got to be absolutely on the nail before the animation starts because if there is any technical reason why the animation has to be repeated, you've wasted the animator's time and the animator might be spending a week, two weeks plus on a shot. So it has to be absolutely ready before the animation starts. Artists will draw every action and every shot and camera angle that Wes has in mind so that you really are planning your movie in drawing form before you shoot it because it's really important not to shoot more than you need because animation is so sort of time consuming. Storyboards are also really important because if a character needs to sit down, you need to tell the puppet makers that he needs to sit down because even actions as simple as that need to be drawn out. It's an incredibly painstaking process because nothing exists. You have to build everything. You have to design everything from scratch. A pencil, a toothpick, we have to build it all, and it all has to be designed. It's very meticulous, and, uh, but it's fun. We're really trying hard to make this not be too technically shiny and, and uh, visual effecty, and so we're trying to really kind of go back to old-fashioned methods and trying to old-fashioned methods of making a stop-motion movie look grand and look, you know, expansive. And so that's been kind of challenging, but in a nice way. It's been fun to sort of think in a different way about how to create shots and tell a story. And I think it's it's paying off. Like we've discovered new ideas on how to do things, and we've gone back to really old methods of doing things, and it's and that's a nice mix.